Hello, welcome to the James Cooley Show. It's your life. And first of all, I want to wish everybody out there a happy, happy Thanksgiving and hope that uh, everybody is together with loved ones, uh, friends, family, and uh, you're enjoying this uh, Thanksgiving uh, holiday weekend, the next couple of days together. You know, so I uh, just want to make sure that everybody is, is all set for that and ready to eat a lot of turkey or ham or whatever the giveaways that goes along with that one you know so uh, happy thanksgiving you know we got an absolutely fantastic guest that's on the show today and i tell you uh this young man is going to educate all of us especially when it comes to our infants our children and young adults and everybody in general you know so we're talking no other than the top-notch doc, Dr. Lester Freeman, and I tell you, we're going we're gonna to get uh, off into him a little bit more, but before I do anything, I have to bring my absolutely wonderful executive producer and co-host, Michelle Cooley, on the show. How are you doing today, Michelle? I'm doing great, doing great, and I want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving as well, and everyone's busy shopping going to the airport, picking up family and friends, but you know, we're still working and we're still plugging in and we're still going to educate you by bringing these wonderful guests on the show today. Wow. You know, Michelle, I'm excited about this guest that we have on today because uh, if you weren't watching the news, uh, they have all these, uh, uh, you know, like uh, infant viruses, RSP, uh, I'm talking about you got the flu, you got all of these different type of things all coming in at the same time. And uh, many of our parents and listeners might not understand uh, what these things are and how to prevent some of these things. So we got an absolutely fantastic guest, Michelle, uh, Dr. Lester Freeman. And uh, I really want to get this started, but I tell you what, whether you're watching on E360 television, YouTube, or, or 20 plus other live streaming network, if you want to be part of the conversation, all you have to do is go to the comments, ask this great doc or Michelle or myself, any questions that you want to, and I promise, I promise i get it on the screen. Michelle, I cannot wait. Can, can we tell our, our viewers and our listeners the title of the show, the purpose of the show, and introduce this absolutely wonderful guest? Yes. Well, the title of the show is called Increase in Respiratory Illnesses in Children and Young Adults. And the purpose of the show is getting to know pediatric specialist, Dr. Lester A. Freeman. He's going to discuss the increase in respiratory illnesses in infants, children, and young adults, and talk about the various types of respiratory illnesses and how children's hospitals are coping with this influx of patients. So let's so tell you a little bit about Dr. Lester Freeman. Dr. Lester Freeman was born and raised for part of his childhood in Harlem, New York City, but relocated to Laurelton, Queens. Dr. Freeman has desired to be a pediatrician since the age of five. One year during the Christmas season, his father asked him a question he had never been asked before. What do you want to be when you grow up? He looked away, confused until his father put him close and whispered in his ear, doctor or lawyer? Dr. Freeman yelled, doctor. His father cheered and then asked, what kind of doctor? Reflectively, he answered, a baby doctor, one that takes care of kids. Every year, his father would ask him the same question until it stuck. Dr. Freeman's motivation stems from his fundamental love for both children and pediatric medicine. His daily goals include educating his patients and their families about pediatric health and inspiring as many children and adolescents as he possibly can to become interested in pursuing a career in medicine. The James Cooley Show, It's Your Life, welcomes back Dr. Lester Freeman to the show. Thank you. How you doing, Dr. Freeman? It's been a while since you've been on. How you doing, my friend? How you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you doing, JC? Thanks. Doing just fine, man. That was an inspiring story that Michelle just said. Uh, she said that uh, your, your dad asked you uh, what you was going to be a doctor, or lawyer, <laughs> and 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 you said a doctor, baby doctor. And guess what? That's what you're doing. That's what you've been doing for the last twenty plus years. You know, you know. So, can you tell our, our listeners, our viewers, a little bit more about yourself and? And what inspired you, other than what your dad uh, put you on the spot, to oh. uh, be this great doctor that you are today? Oh, well, thank you very much. It's very kind of you, uh, JC. Um, well, like it, like my like your executive producer said, it was during Christmas, and my father was asking each one of us, my two older siblings and my youngest sibling, what we wanted for Christmas. And so after we gave our 
very long list of, um, of requests for Christmas presents. Then he asked me, okay, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he was the first person to ever ask me that. So I, I thought about it and I was, and he was whispered in my ear, doctor or lawyer? And he said, and so I yelled out doctor. And he said, what kind of doctor? And I, automatically I just said, baby doctor. And I didn't know what a pediatrician was, but uh, I, and I learned later that I want, I'd rather be on the pediatric side rather than the OBGYN side. So, that, so I just looked, I was good in math and science. I enjoyed it. And so I just knew that that was my, that was my path from that point on. Wow. You know, so, uh, uh, it's, uh, in the news a lot, uh, they're talking about all the different type of illness that are happening at the same time today, uh, especially with our infants, uh, young children and young adults. Uh, can you uh, kind of tell our, our viewers and our listeners, what exactly are you seeing in your office these days as it relate to uh, uh, today's illnesses? Well, we have to go back just one year to last year, uh, 2021, where at least in Georgia and probably other parts of the country, there was practically no winter in, in Georgia. The, the, the weather was kind of mild even during the winter season. And so we kind of paid for that during the, throughout the course of the 2022 year, especially around uh, the summertime. The, the summertime we started seeing um, respiratory diseases that we didn't see previously, the previous years. For example, we saw RSV bronchiolitis, uh, influenza I saw in, in um, beginning of August and late July even, and, and other, many other cold viruses and plus not only the viruses themselves, but the complications they may bring. Wow. You know, so right now they talk about this RSV uh, mm -hmm. bronchitis. Can you uh, tell our viewers and listeners exactly what is that? Okay. And, and how does it affect uh, the infants? Like that's what they're talking about, you think? Okay. RSV stands for respiratory syncytial virus. It is a highly contagious infectious disease. And it, it strikes ev everybody. In a healthy um, person, like an adult or, or even a healthy child, you get the, the upper respiratory symptoms, meaning coughing, sneezing, runny nose, okay, F just feeling miserable. Um, but in certain high risk populations, certain vulnerable populations, it, the symptoms could be a lot worse. For, for example, in premature infants, and, and infants and children that have pulmonary, uh, born with pulmonary complications or uh, cardiovascular complications, meaning congenital, congenital means born with. Uh, whenever R they get into contact with RSV, uh, respiratory syncytial virus, it can produce those symptoms that I mentioned earlier. And then they can develop wheezing as if they were asthmatic, um, as well as, um, you know, increased shortness of breath, uh, change in color, you know, they can turn dusky, meaning very gray, very blue, and they can even go into respiratory distress or respiratory failure as well. Wow. So, uh, Dr. Freeman, when was this disease first discovered? Was it is something that happened in the United States or did it come from overseas? When did we first notice uh, uh, this in the increase in the United States? Well, it's always been around. It's just that we were unable to isolate it. So when I was doing my training in the, the 1990s, I'm dating myself here, uh, in the 1990s, and I never heard of respiratory syncytial virus. But then when I started seeing it every day and see how dangerous that it, can, that it can be. So it's been around, it's been around forever. It's just that during the, uh, I'll say late 80s, early 90s, that's when we started developing actual uh, tests for it and to, so we can isolate it and therefore we can put a name to the, the disease that, um, and then we can treat the patient appropriately. What are, what are some of the symptoms, common symptoms that uh, okay. uh, infant or young, young child might be experiencing and that's noticeable where it calls a parent to uh, okay. think about this? In a healthy child, 
let's say you have a healthy infant or a healthy uh, child of school age, you have the upper respiratory system, like I mentioned earlier, the coughing, the sneezing, the runny nose, low grade fever, meaning like a fever, we consider fever 100.4 or higher. So 100.4 would, would be considered low grade fever. That usually lasts about less than about a few days, about a week or more. But then you start to notice um, wheezing, like the child is having difficulty breathing. And that will manifest itself as a, a increased work of breathing, where you see it called retractions, where you see their ribs going in and out, trying to force air into in, in their lungs. You see the nasal flaring like like this, like I'm demonstrating right now. I don't know if everybody can see it like that. That's called nasal flaring. The reason why it does that is it increases the surface area so that you can take in more O2, more air. And of course, um, decrease appetite, decrease activity, and um, sooner or later you develop, you just become listless because of all the decreased oxygen and all the increased work of breathing. And your, your diaphragm, which controls your breathing, which pushes you, pushes things in and out of your lungs. It gets, it's, a, it's like any other muscle, it gets tired. So the, a major complication of RSV bronchiolitis is you get respiratory failure, where your diaphragm gets so tired that it's like, oh, I need a break. Because you, it's, it develops something called tachypnea, where it's working over time. So it's going faster than it usually uh, should be going for a, longer, for a long period of time. And your body can't sustain that for very long. And so uh, as a consequence, you have um, respiratory failure and a child will start getting sleepy because their, their carbon dioxide, their carbon dioxide level will increase in their um, metabolism. And then they sometimes even, um, you know, go to sleep. And that's when we have to do, intervene and breathe, help breathe for the child. And usually that child ends up in step down units or, or the, the intensive care units. Wow. Uh, you know, so what's the difference between that? I mean, it seems like some of the symptoms are the same as the flu. Uh, what's difference that disease from the flu? I, I, and everybody who knows who's, who's ever had the flu will know what I'm talking about. A cold is a cold. Okay, cold, you have upper respiratory symptoms, like I mentioned earlier, I won't go through them again. But in addition to that, you have a high grade, a higher grade fever. Okay, not every person who has influenza has a fever, but those that do have a fever, it's usually higher grade, like 102, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have headaches, uh, myalgia, which is another word of saying muscle aches, okay? Uh, fatigue, like chronic fatigue, like you're just tired all the time, okay? And, but you may or may not have wheezing depending on what your, your status is. If, you have, if you're asthmatic, yes, then you'll wheeze. But it's a, it's a, it's a total body almost drain on you and you're dehydrated also. Wow. You, Why are you, you know, dehydrated? Uh, no, 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 no. So we're gonna take a station break. Okay. We're gonna come back. We're gonna pick this up because uh, I, I, I want to get off into who is more susceptible or having uh, this RSVP. I mean RSV. So we're gonna take a station break, but we're gonna come back and uh, we're gonna continue our discussion with Doctor Lester Freeman. It's your life. I'm Doctor James J C Cool. We'll be back shortly after the break. Thank you. Really get a chance to know who you are. And once you know who you are, you truly know who you are, love who you are. Love who you are. Your masterpiece. Love who you are. Love who you were born to be. Love, love me some me. That's what I'm talking about. When you leave high school, you gotta know today or tomorrow, hopefully today, what your plans are. Hopefully, you know, there is no bad decision unless there is no plan. Create, collaborate, commit with confidence. Commit with what? Confidence. Commit with what? Confidence. And everything that you do.
Hello, welcome back to the James Cooley Show. It's your life, and uh, we got this absolutely fantastic doctor on that's sharing and a lot of knowledge with us, especially when it comes to our uh, infants, our uh, young children, and our uh, young adults. As it relates right now, we're talking about uh, RSP, and uh, I want to pick it up with that. And if you want to be part of this conversation, all you have to do is just go to the comments, ask this great doctor any question that you want to, and I promise I'll get it on the screen. So. Dr. Freeman, I want to pick it back up with this because uh, we were talking about RSV. RSV. And uh, is there a population that's more susceptible to this disease or this illness than others? Yes, good question, JC. Uh, the population would be premature infants, okay? That's infants who were born prior to 38 weeks of gestation. Uh, infants that have congenital or chronic respiratory problems or chronic respiratory, I mean, chronic or congenital heart problems. Children that were born with coarctation of the aorta, tetralogy of Fallot, uh, truncus arteriosus, et cetera, et cetera. They have, they have issues. Patients who, who had RDS when they were born, that's respiratory distress syndrome when they were born, they're more susceptible. But it doesn't stop there. It goes to even the higher levels of people who are uh, greater than 65 years of age um, and also asthmatics as well. If you, you have asthma, you're more susceptible to uh, getting complications of RSV. And they, do you see this? Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Do, do, do you see this in, in older uh, adults as well? Or is yeah. it just pain, yes, pain, I tell you about that? Yes. Yeah, but in the older adults, and they, it's just a cold. You know, they, they, they develop their regular upper respiratory symptoms and they move on with their life. Unless they are compromised with those uh, diseases, diseases I mentioned earlier or disorders I mentioned earlier. Okay, so what is the management and treatment, especially for our, our infants and young, young kids? How would you go about treating uh, those type of patients uh, for this disease? It depends yeah. on the child. But generally speaking, if you have any sort of serious respiratory illness, like whether it's RSV, influenza, uh, COVID-19, et cetera, et cetera, you are officially dehydrated. Your hydration is at risk. So we want to make sure that all children make sure that they hydrate even more than they're used to hydrating. If they're used to taking a certain amount of ounces per, per day, double it. Because when we cough, when we sneeze, we throw out respiratory droplets. Okay, and these respiratory droplets cause us to become more dehydrated. Plus, if you have fever, that also causes dehydration. All right, so you have to increase the amount of liquids that they take in. Uh, in addition, rest cannot be understated. Okay, rest is extremely important. So you need your rest. Your body needs to recoup and so that it can fight off uh, this disease. A third thing is if you do have asthma or if you are wheezing, we can get some, something that will open up your lungs, a bronchodilator, such as albuterol, Zopinex, uh, things of that nature. Steroids won't, won't help with um, RSV. It's been proven. So just uh, bronchodilators will definitely help. Okay, so uh, listen on the news every day recently that uh, uh, most of the hospital beds, uh, especially when it comes to infants and young, young kids or feel, uh, how are we going to be able to educate uh, uh, the parents on some of the things that they might want to do to help control the spread and help control the uh, severe symptoms of this disease? Well, first thing they could do is, in, it sounds rudimentary, sounds elementary, but washing your hands, washing your hands and not sharing, if they're, if they're toddlers, not sharing toys with other kids, because, you know, children are, are known, known to be breeders of, and um, petri, your human petri, petri dishes when it comes to diseases and things of that nature. So make sure not to share toys, not to put things in your mouth, 
wash your hands quite frequently, um, covering your mouth uh, with, when you cough or sneeze. The, the basic common sense things uh, are extremely helpful for limiting the spread of the disease within families, within daycare centers, and within schools. For our listeners out there, in case you're just tuning in to the show, uh, we got Dr. Lester Freeman, and he's talking about a lot of the things, boys, in this, especially this time of year, uh, that affect primarily our infants and our young uh, young kids. And uh, right now we're talking about RSV. And a uh, hey, doc. Yes. Now, sir. now so um, what are some of the other types or illnesses and diseases that this time of year that uh, our parents, our listeners need to be aware of, especially when it comes to the kids? Okay. Well, you, you have your typical cold viruses, which we consider rhinoviruses, which are over 100 serotypes. That means types of viruses within that family that affect everybody. At least, you know, people have at least three colds a year. Some people, children, it could be over six colds a year. So rhinoviruses, regular common cold viruses, are also very prevalent. And like I said, if you run into any of those high risk groups, like I mentioned earlier, um, they can cause more problems for kids who are susceptible. Um, also, coronavirus, believe, believe it or not, is still around. Um, and also influenza types A, B, and H1N1 still in existence. Can you explain uh, the different types of flu, just like what you said? Uh, what's the severity of each one of the different types, A, B, C? Mm -hmm. can, can you explain that too? Well, not to get too technical, but you have the seasonal flu, and then you have this, the, the special flu, like the avian flu, the swine flu, and et cetera, et cetera. But we're, we're not counting those. That those, those are unique. Those are very rare. But the seasonal flu, those, you, think, you think of types A, B, H1, N1. Fortunately, uh, and they have some of the same symptoms as RSV bronchiolitis, meaning coughing, sneezing, runny nose, et cetera, et cetera. Like I mentioned earlier, they also have increased fever, chills. The reason why they have that is because their temperature is above a certain threshold, which is like 102 and beyond. They have um, muscle fatigue, um, headaches, things of that nature. Wow. You know, so uh, do you run across a patient or patients with a combination of all of these diseases? And <laughs> if so... How you go about treating if they got the RSP and the flu and cold? How, how how you go about treating those type of patients? I've only known of one patient that I've had so far this year that I've had that has had RSV and the flu, and that patient ended up being hospitalized. Um, but all ordinarily you just get one or the other. Um, but you have to be aware, be wary of the complications as well. With parents out there, uh, and they can't have the, a doctor inside the house all, always, what would you uh, encourage them to do? I'm talking about other than, I mean, you know, make sure you wash your hands, make sure you do this. What would you encourage them to do to keep from running back and forth to the emergency room and to the doctor uh, that could help prevent these things? Is it some type of men like aspirins or whatever yeah, can, can you talk well, about that a little bit but if you catch the flu you, you can only take tylenol i suggest tylenol first and because if you take aspirin if you have the if you're diagnosed with the flu then you, you run into a complication called reyes syndrome r-e-y-e-s which is you know a whole different um talk okay uh, but you develop that, that sort of um, complication but other than that, you need to go see your doctor. Um, keep your kid at home, please. Because parents are notorious, some parents, let me just qualify that, are notorious for if their child is sick, they don't want to miss any days at work. Or they, uh, either that or they don't want their child in the home, whatever, for, for whatever reason. So they send a the child to school sick, or they send a the child to daycare sick. And that just exposes everybody you know, in that facility to um, to those particular diseases. 
Yeah, so uh, our, our listeners, especially parents out there, I mean, I hope you're taking heed uh, to this. And the doc just said something that's important about uh, if over the counter, uh, if, if you got the flu or RSVP, it's Tylenol, not asthma. I did not know that, doc. <laughs> I'm glad that that you uh, clarified that because I would have grabbed me a couple of asthma. <laughs> you know, so we're going to take a station break. But we're going to come back and we're going to pick it up. We're going to continue our, our great discussion with Dr. Lester Freeman. You want to be part of the conversation? Come on. Go to the comments. Ask them any question you want. And I put, I get it on the screen. And we'll get you an answer. It's your life. I'm Dr. James J.C. Cool. We'll be back shortly after the break. Courage. Valor. Experience. The values that make veterans are the values that make veteran businesses America's number one choice. Veteran business owners throughout the nation are ready to connect. Opsforvets.com. Handshakes, not handouts. Ops for Vets connects veterans with business opportunities. Here is a closer look at a featured veteran business. Every business listed is a verified veteran-owned business and can be found in the OpsForVets.com supplier directory. OpsForVets.com. Get on the grid. Hello. Hey, I'm James Cooley. I am the founder and CEO of the J.C. Cooley Foundation, Options Opportunity Slash Choice Program. Our primary mission is to help build the foundation of our youth and young adults and communities and we encourage everyone to dream big, think big, and be big at everything you do. And the way that you do that is, first of all, you got to believe in yourself. You have to believe in yourself. You have to know that you are here for a purpose. You also have to be able to step out your comfort zone and do things that you, that you probably didn't think that you can do. Noah Dingley here, producer of The James Cooley Show, It's Your Life. And the new audio version of James' book, Country Boy, City Boy, A Journey That Ain't Over Yet, is a must-have. James shares his true life story of struggle and success in America. It's both a cautionary tale and a roadmap to achieving the American dream. Get the new audio version of Country Boy, City Boy, A Journey That Ain't Over Yet, by James Cooley on Amazon.com or wherever audiobooks are sold. Life is a series of circles and cycles, phrases and stages. These experiences teach you the lessons of life. You can either ignore them or embrace them. Welcome to It's Your Life with James Cooley. James is a motivational speaker, author, military veteran, and founder of the J.C. Cooley Foundation. James is here to equip you to strive for greatness and overcome adversity. It's time to get you equipped today for the challenges of tomorrow. Now, here's the host of It's Your Life, James Cooley. Hello, welcome back to It's Your Life. I'm, I'm your host, Dr. James J.C. Cooley, and we got our fantastic guest, Dr. Lester Freeman, educating us on some of the illness that we can expect, you know, that our infants, our youth, and young adults, and children might be experiencing this time of year. I mean, as, as you know, winter time is getting ready to start in about two weeks, and it's sometime, if wherever you're at, it probably feel like winter already, <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, Dr. Freeman is just laying down some of the things that we need to be aware of. So if you want to be part of this conversation, ask this great doc any questions you want to, just go to the comments and ask them. Hey, Dr. Freeman, now we've been talking about uh, the flu, RSV, uh, colds. Um, can you explain to our audience, uh, is any of these, which I know some of them might be, uh, severe deadly disease that could occur or, or and, and if if so which age population uh mostly experience uh, the most difficult time with uh, these type of illnesses yes um like i mentioned premature infants uh children or infants with a chronic or congenital diseases like res respiratory and cardiac diseases like um RDS, uh, as well as like 
coarctation or the aorta tetralogy of the low, truncus arteriosus, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, patent persistent PDA, um, et cetera, et cetera. Those are, those are one. Also, anybody that's aged 65 years and up, anybody that's immunocompromised in any way, especially, especially respiratory wise, um, if you, if you um, catch the flu and you're diabetic, that could be a problem. And anybody that has asthma, that's an issue. Um, I would say that population. Also healthcare workers, believe it or not, because we're exposed to so many different kinds of diseases and disorders, especially infectious diseases. What would you encourage, uh, okay, prior to entering the fall or, or the winter season, uh, do you encourage uh, any type of vaccination? I know, I know the flu shot every year. Uh, any type of vaccination or change of lifestyle to help cope with this or certain type of vitamins or, or foods that uh, um, our listeners and viewers might want to consider? One, uh, just basic hand washing is good. Basic, basic hygienic, hygienic care is, is optimal. Optimize as much as you can. Uh, practice, you know, common, a lot of common sense, even though we know common sense is not common. Uh, for people who are susceptible, like anybody over the age of six months and older, 65 year old patients, healthcare workers, anybody that's immunocompromised, they need, uh, we, we require them to get an influenza vaccine. Okay, what, what, uh, why is so many? families out there not taking heed uh, to getting vaccinated, the flu vaccinated? Uh, well, and- well uh, a lot of families are afraid of autism uh, and ADHD, things that can affect the neurological processes, meaning the brain. Uh, people are terrified of that, especially in our community, in the African-American community, where it seems everything is, you know, accentuated or exponentially worse, but they're, they're afraid of that. They're afraid of having mercury in our vaccines, which they've proven to be uh, several times, different studies that there is no uh, bimerosol in most of our vaccines, if not all of them. Uh, that used to be a, an issue back in the I think, 90s, but kids, are, there's, there, there's still uh, no mercury in the vaccines. Yeah, kids are still becoming autistic, you know, so that, that can't be it. So that's why I always encourage families, especially susceptible populations, to get the uh, flu vaccines. Because what the flu vaccine will do, I, I know you're probably going to get to this, but the flu vaccine will do is it will immunize the patient against the, the, the four most common kinds of flu during this particular season. And somehow the CDC and those who work there somehow try to predict which flu bug is dominant in the, in the upcoming year. And they try to recreate that and, and produce that. So what happens is when you get a flu shot, flu shot is called a quadri, quadrivalent shot. That means there's four different types of um, viruses which they combat. Uh, influenza type A, B, H1N1, and I forgot the the fourth one, forgive me. But it, it combats all four that are, that are going to be the most common kinds of influenza virus that's going to attack the population during a given year. And so they, you usually, like I said, the influenza is usually done in the before the, before the month of October. We would like for you know, everybody to get a flu shot before the month of October. Because by the time you get into November, December, January, you know it's almost too late. You could you could have caught the flu, even though, like I said in the beginning of this broadcast, um, this year was kind of unusual because of the change in weather patterns from the previous previous year. We started seeing the flu in July, in the beginning of August, which is still within this the summer month, you know, season. Um, but okay. No, no, you, no. I, I was just thinking. You mentioned four different types of of flu, and uh, how do you go about determining? I'm talking about uh, which 
one it is and you mentioned also about uh, the vaccine that they create uh, over the last couple of years or whatever to combat these but uh how, how do you all determine which level of the flu uh, that a patient might have? Well, there are tests uh, that, that usually most physicians' offices have, and definitely the hospitals and emergency departments, which will determine whether you have uh, type A, type B, or H1N1, depend, depending on the size of the, of the test that you're using. And so when you get those tests, and those tests are pretty, pretty dependable, pretty reliable, where within 15 minutes or so, you can get an answer, whether it's type A, type B, or, or beyond. And once you do, then you have your answer. And, but uh, as far as treatment is concerned, I know you probably wouldn't know the treatment. Oh, if yeah, you, yeah. If you, within 72 hours, if you've been diagnosed and have symptoms of the type A, say influenza type A, then there are treatment options that are more available to you than if you waited four or five days with symptoms and you had and you were determined to be type A or type B, which is Tamiflu. Tamiflu is, is a medication that's prescribed by, um, you know, authorized medical staff, meaning doctors and nurse practitioners, which will serve to not eliminate the disease, but it can cut the, the disease duration in half. So well, instead, of it, so instead of it lasting a few days, I mean up to two weeks or more, it can last half that time. Doctor Freeman, this uh, it's been said recently, as late as yesterday, that there is a severe shortage of the diff the different type of treatments for as uh, vaccinations for as medical for. Uh, these type of symptoms, I'm talking about the flu, RSV, et cetera. How would, uh, if it's a shortage, how would, uh, uh, I guess, the disease control center or whoever make this uh, speed up the process so that we have enough of uh, this uh, uh, medicine uh, to uh, actually ensure that we don't start losing our kids and our infants and etc well let's be clear uh there is no cure per se for the, the common cold or rsv okay or any particular kind of virus there's no cure for it there are things that mitigate its spread uh like the tamiflu but most of the time just with just like any most other viruses you you you, you let your own body's immune system deal with it and it'll go away in time you know, with that said, um, things like Tamiflu, um, basic hygiene and hand washing and um, uh, getting the flu vaccine early enough will help you um, survive this uh, infectious disease in the seasonal period. Wow. You know, this year, uh, Michelle and I uh, both caught the flu and I think Michelle just not getting over it mm -hmm. and this year for some reason it's instead of lasting four or five days it lasts like two weeks or longer right. uh what why is it like that this year that's different than last year and year before like i said the seasonally when since we didn't have any frost any real cold weather last year i can only count account for georgia we, our, our our uh winter last year it was like 65 degrees, you know, 70 degrees, even going up to the high 70s. So we didn't have a real winter. So the frost didn't kill a lot of things off that it normally kills off during that part of the season. And so everything was stretched into the pre the next year. So uh, like I mentioned, we started seeing RSV in July and the flu in August. It, it's, it's amazing. Um, these hospitals, especially the pediatric hospitals are being overrun with patients and it's just uh, saturating and super saturating the emergency department services. Um, in, in Atlanta, where I, where I reside, the Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, the, the three main hospitals, Hughes Spalding, Eggleston, 
Scottish Rite Hospital, uh, so saturated with patients that they did, they put up tents, like in MASH, in the show MASH, but they put up tents outside of the emergency department to deal with the overflow. And you have waiting hours, waiting times of three to nine hours. I, mean, I know earlier in was, was it November, I say October, they had a nine hour wait to see the doctor, which is unprecedented. Wow. You know, uh, yeah, I, I think we got to get this under control. We're going to take a station break, but we're going to come back and we're going to pick it up, Dr. Lester Freeman, and continue to talk about some of the things that we need to do uh, to help ease the illnesses uh, as it relates to risk, respiratory illness. It's your life. I'm Dr. James J.C. Cooley. We'll be back shortly after the break. Hello, welcome back to the James Cooley Show. It's your life. And I, I tell you, we got Dr. Uh, Lester Freeman here. I mean, really, uh, I tell you, he's putting it out there. He's educating us. And and he is, uh, you know, I tell you, telling us things that we might want to pay attention to uh, because it affects our kids and they respect uh, not just the kids, but everybody. And, uh, and I tell you, I think we kind of lost him for a second, but uh, right now we're talking about uh, the flu, we were talking about RS, uh, B, talking about a lot of different things. And uh, I think that we need to take heed to what this great doctor is telling us and uh, start practicing now the, some of the safe habits that uh, he is encouraging us to do, especially washing your hands and, and you know, covering your, your mouth. And like my mother in law was saying, well, where's your mask? Sometimes we have to pick that mask back up. And because um, just like he mentioned a little bit earlier that COVID is still out there. And uh, and I'm going to ask him this question. You know, it's so, Doc, now COVID is still out there. Yes. And we, yes. And we got all of these other uh, respiratory illnesses that are there. How you guys go about distinguishing which one is which? I'm talking about COVID. I know we, we're still taking the test, got home uh, tests that, that, that we take. Uh, but I think you're a big stickler or that even if you take the home test that you might want to get that other type of test uh, as well. Can you, can you tell our viewers a little bit about that? 
Yes. Um, you know, n nowadays you can get a a test for COVID at home. You have a home kit where it gives you a result in 15 minutes. The only drawback to that test is that it gives you a lot of false negatives and uh, false positives. But uh, the most reliable test is called PCR, polymerase chain reaction test. And it usually takes between 24 and 48 hours for that to come back, but it's a lot more accurate. So yeah. you get a lot more true positives. And so that will determine whether you have COVID or not. Have you seen a decrease uh, over the last uh, few months, uh, a trend down with twin uh, for as people actually getting COVID? Uh, because we don't practice like we used to when it was really out there. Do right. you see that? Yes, it, it, there is a downward trend, but at the same time, it's still present, especially now that people are out and about and around each other. It's still not, uh, because we're in the winter season, people tend to huddle up inside their homes and huddle up when they get, get into schools. And that sort of interaction, that sort of um, proximity, near proximity, um, causes you to share respiratory droplets either via through the air for coughing or sneezing or via handshake because when you cough or sneeze in your hands and you put your hands on things it can spread that way as well what do you expect of thanksgiving is tomorrow and you know friday but when you get back to the office do you anticipate there would be an increase in in patient loads uh due to all of these respiratory illnesses and because families are gathering together and not protecting themselves in a lot of ways. What, are, what is your out, outlook on that? I think definitely uh, we're going to see entire families, which, which happens often, come to the office where uh, two or more members of the family are ill uh, with the same disease, whether it's influenza, uh, bad, uh, bad uh, rhinovirus type cold, um, RSV, et cetera. So that's that's just going to go up. That, that, that's that's normal, and the, the hospitals will be twice as busy again. And you expect that to happen? I'm talking about, I mean, we we haven't even hit one yet. <laughs> right. And but, um, but but you know, people people are, are together for the most part during the holiday season. And during the holiday season, you share more. You 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 touch your neighbor. You you touch your your relative. And if you're sick and you're in that environment, you know, things will happen and people will get sick. You know, Dr. Freeman, now, uh, what would be your recommendation to uh, not just to not just the kids, I mean, the parents with the kids, but to people in general on how they can get their immune system up, certain types of foods, certain type of vitamins or, you know, what, what would be your recommendation? Uh, but before, to we get into, before we get into the supplements, just begin to just the regular eating. Uh, all kids should, or everybody in general should eat a very well balanced meal, cut back on the sugar, the excess salt, the processed food, and eat things. It's, I know it's very difficult, it's extremely difficult uh, in, in the climate and the society we live in to eat healthy all the time. But you just have to do your very best. The, the very first thing to, uh, towards getting there is acknowledging that there is a situation, there is a problem and with your eating and with what you have in your cupboard or pantry or refrigerator. So once you just try to take away those elements that you know are not good for you, uh, the items I mentioned earlier, then that's a, a first step into uh, Good help. Well, yeah, I want to kind of get back to the flu a little bit, but that that's good advice. And I mean, before we do that, what are some of the supplements that you might recommend? Uh, Don? And vitamin C, zinc, uh, vitamin B complexes. Um, they even have something called elderberry, which has a lot of vitamin C in it. And the purpose behind those. It's because it boosts your immune system. Vitamin E too, by the way. It boosts your immune system, keeps it stronger. But remember, they're supplements. 
a supplement means in addition to the main course. So you have to eat well in order for supplements to be even more effective. If you eat poorly and then take a supplement, that's not going to do the trick. You have to eat well and then take the supplements. So, so you know, you got to eat well and then take the supplements. You know, uh, you know, Dr. Freeman, I, I know you in the hospital as well. How is the hospital system handling what's going on right now? I'm talking about with these three major uh, respiratory illnesses. What are they doing to uh, to mitigate uh, some of this? And how how are they doing this when the hospitals are filled up? What do they send the patients? Well, we are being overworked <laughs> <laughs> and overrun with uh, all these patients, which is great from a, a business standpoint, a financial standpoint, but terrible as far as a healthcare set, healthcare uh, situation, because you want your patients to be healthy. And so when they come in and you treat them, but then if there's an overload, you don't, you hope nothing was missed. Yeah. And we're down to the last couple of minutes, Doc. doc okay. And uh, what are uh, uh, three takeaways you want our, our viewers and our listeners to get from this great conversation that we're having? Well, one, to use your common sense. Pre prevention is better than looking for a cure. So like I said, good hygiene, um, good hand washing technique, cover your mouth, be, be very uh, respectful of the person next to you. Don't crowd anybody. If you're sick, stay home. I know it's hard for some people who go to work or in school, but do your best to try to stay home. Um, and three, if you're in the susceptible population, especially, please get a flu shot because it'll save your life and uh, the people around you. Well, Dr. Freeman, if, if someone wanted to reach out to you to get more information or if they're in the Atlanta area, and just wanted uh, looking for a great doc how would they go about getting in touch with you oh, thank you jc you can call me at my office teens little ones and children's pediatrics llc the number is 404-691-4321 that's 404-691-4321 dr freeman it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show you know you got to open invitation my friend anytime that you want to come on and educate our, our listening audience our, our viewers or uh, the door is wide open you know so uh, i want to thank you for taking the time to come on the show today i'd like to thank uh, my great great uh, zex producer and co-host michelle cooley for doing all of the heavy lifting writing the programs and just putting this thing together to kind of make the host look good when you got somebody to, you know, like that. most importantly I'd like to thank our viewers and our listeners for taking the time to tune into the James Cooley Show, It's Your Life. I want everybody to have a happy, wonderful Thanksgiving and holidays to follow. And always keep in mind, you can do anything you set your mind to. Always dream big, think big, and be big. We'll see you next week on the James happy Thanksgiving. Cooley Show, It's Your Life.